If I just take your Bibles with me and turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 19 through 24. John 5, verse 19 through 24. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father comes, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show you, so that you may marvel. For as the Father rises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. May the Lord bless you in the of his word. Let us pray. Father God, again, we thank you these words that speak about the authority that you have, God, and the authority that you have given Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We ask you, O oh God, now to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to come into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning is just a continuation of what we had started last week in our series on authority, and specifically talking about the authority that God has, and whom to, does he give that authority. And so just to... Oh, do we have the PowerPoint? There's no PowerPoint there? Oh, something wrong, wrong with that. Hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> Is there the slides for announcements after that? No? Oh, no, what's wrong with it? Program sometimes, eh? Technology is great when it works. Not so great when it doesn't work right. Because <laughs> I know I put that in there. But anyway, uh, so just to review the first two points from last week. First, we talked about how God shows his authority. He does that in many ways, uh, including showing his power, um, his knowledge of all things, and that he's everywhere at all times. Those are the, the, the three big theological terms we use for that is omnipresence, Omniscience and omnipotence are those big theological terms that we use. Uh, the second thing we looked at last week is that Jesus and the Holy Spirit have authority from the Father. And we pretty much see that in this passage we just read just now, how the Father gives his authority to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus had mentioned how he only does what he sees the Father doing. And so the Father gives his authority to Jesus and gives his authority to the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Does it mean that the Holy Spirit or Jesus are lesser than the Father? Because as we know about the Trinity is that they're all co-equal. But within the Trinity, all three of them have different roles. And it's interesting to see how, even in the Godhead, how the Son and the Holy Spirit submits to the Father. Now, for some, that might sound like a new theology, but it's not new because it's in God's Word. It's just not taught that often. But we do see that in Scripture, that the Son submits to the Father, because he only does what he sees the Father doing, and the Holy, Smith, Holy Spirit submits also to Jesus and the Father. The third thing we'll look at this morning is that God gives authority. Now we understand, again, that the Father gives authority to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but God, all three of them together, the Godhead, gives their authority to others. In 2 Peter 1, verse 21, it says, For no prophecy has ever been produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God 
as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now this is speaking specifically to those that God gives the word of prophecy to and speaks the prophecy, but those prophecies aren't given by people themselves, but God gives those prophecies to people to give. To give maybe to a person or to the church. So then when prophets speak, they're not speaking on just their own authority, but the authority that God has given them to speak from. <clears throat> that speaks to a little bit to about who gives authority, or about a certain per- group of people that give authority, <clears throat> but there's specific areas and people that God gives authority. And there's five specifically we're going to look at here. First, God gives unlimited authority, sorry, l- not unlimited, limited authority to the angels. God lives, gives limited authority to angels. Hebrews 2, verse 7 to 8 says this, You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now these verses here are specifically speaking about Jesus. Hold on one thought. I'll get there. Jesus, uh, if this is speaking about Jesus and the authority that he has. And when we came in the form of mankind, he was the, here a little lower than the angels. Now, Jesus obviously had all authority and power still. But God, it shows that God gives authority to the angels. What was your question, Ariel? That's Hebrews 2, verse 7 to 8. So God gives limited authority to the angels. In fact, actually, there's another passage that speaks to that very thing about how someday we as people are going to have the authority to judge angels. Um, So it shows that there's a certain level of authority that God gives and may change that level of authority depending on the timing of of what God wants to do. Then B, God gives limited authority to demons. Now that might sound really weird, but God has given a certain limited authority to demons to do, in a way, God's bidding still. That might sound strange, but whenever we see in Scripture, and even in today, when we see the demonic happens, God allows it to happen for His glory and purpose still. Does that mean God's commanding to go do those things? Not at all. Uh, we, when God gives a command for, in, for supernatural beings to do something, it's always the angels that God calls them to do it. But if God wants something to happen, but there's some parts that he doesn't want to actually just dish out to his angels, he'll say, who is willing to do this? And always in Scripture we see it's demonic beings that say, I'll do that. Now there's more to speak on that, and that's for another time to when we do a series someday, maybe in the future, on spiritual warfare. But it's important to understand still, too, that God does give a limited authority to demons. Matthew 8, verse 31 to 32. The demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. This displays a little bit of the authority that demons have. They were able to drive the demons into the sea and drown in the waters. We see this too when people are possessed by demons. Now, let's be clear about this here for a second. Christians cannot be possessed. We can be oppressed or in other words, demonized, but we cannot be controlled by demons. Those who aren't Christians can possibly be controlled by demons. And that's part of the authority that God allows them to have until the person becomes a Christian. They don't have that kind of authority over Christians anymore then. Then C, God gives limited authority to people. Revelations 2 verse 26 to 27 says this, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over nations. And he will rule them with an iron rod, 
as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. Here it's speaking of how God gives authority to people. Then also, several chapters later in Revelation 11, verse 3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So we see that God gives limited authority to people. And in this context of these two passages, it had to do with what God wanted it to do. And these are in the end times when it comes to um, specifically the tribulation period. And then D, God gives limited authority to governments. Romans 13.1, uh, this is probably a verse we are familiar with these days, aren't we? especially as we came out of COVID uh, a few years, a couple years ago, um, that God does give authority to the government. But here's what it says in Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that God ex exist have been instituted by God. So God gives limited authority to governments, too. Now, we would need to study further because further in Romans verse two, uh, chapter 13, verse 2 and on, speaks to actually the authority the government has. They do not have unlimited authority over people. Only limited authority, specifically when it comes to justice. That's where the government has authority over all of us. But for example, the government does not have authority over us in who we are to worship and how we are to worship. We are to obey God first and always God because He has ultimate authority and He is God. Then E, lastly, God has given limited authority to Christians. Now, two points ago, we talked about how God has given authority to people, but again, it depends on which people group and for what purpose? And God has specifically given authority to Christians over the spiritual realm to an extent and over other things around us as well to an extent. Here's a couple of passages that speak to that. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, that being Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Similarly to that passage, Mark 16, verse 15 through 18. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, in other words, in the authority that Jesus has given us, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They'll pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. That speaks to the authority that God has given us. And I think that is of some comfort for us as Christians too, that even the demons are subjective to us. When we command them to stop tempting us, and we command them to flee, they must flee, as it says in one of Peter's letters. That is a great comfort to us. But even Jesus said, though, too, not to celebrate over that necessarily. Not to celebrate over that, but celebrate that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But I think it's still of comfort to us to know that God has given us that kind of authority over demons. Sherry and I have been going to a, a course Tuesday nights on spiritual warfare. And I've been interested in that subject for a long time. I remember back to my early college days, even late high school days. <coughs> was un, I was interested about what is... With the demonic, what authority and power do we have? 
Because we need to understand that, in, even in this day and age too. We hear more of that stuff happening in places like Africa, in, in tribes in Africa, but we don't see that as often here in North America, North American culture. But believe me that it is happening around us. And so as we've been taking this course together, I know I'm starting to understand more of the authority that God has given us over the demonic and understanding what demons can or cannot do. And I tell you, as we study this, I'm comforted to know the authority that God has over them, but also the authority God has given us over the demonic. Romans 8.37 speaks to that. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then also, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? If Jesus is going to give us this kind of authority over the angels someday, even now in this life he has given us. You want to the verse again? 1 Corinthians 6, 3. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. So someday we're going to judge the angels. Imagine the kind of authority that God has given us in that. And then Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. God has given authority to Christians, but even to a smaller group within Christianity, the leaders of the church, God has given authority over the church. And those leaders specifically are the elders of the church. It's neat because as yesterday, Sherry, or not Sherry, Ariel had asked me a question. She had played a video for me about authority in essence. And, and so she asked me, what do you think about this video? And, and there was nothing that was really wrong with it, but it opened up a good conversation between Ariel and I to understand authority and who has authority, specifically in the church. Yes, God has given authority to elders to lead the church, and in essence, serving the church. But again, it's authority that God has given in certain areas of life. Uh, maybe dealing with discipline in the church listening to God for direction for the church and the way we're to go, giving directions to certain areas of ministry in the church to fulfill the vision that God has given the church to fulfill. But also give that for people to understand that that, lim that authority is still limited and limited by what God gives. I remember part of the conversation that Ariel, had, Ariel and I had that, well, what about the authority that men in general have? And I think the question that Ariel had, I think it was that, can one husband tell another husband, other man's wife what to do? I think that was the only question you had yesterday. And the answer to that is that no. Only the husband of the wife has authority. But again, limited authority because he's the leader of the family. I heard this from a coach that I had worked with many years ago in another church. And he had said, the higher up in leadership you have, the less options you have. What that means is the higher up in leadership you are involved in, you cannot think about yourself and your own wants and desires. You have to think first of the needs of those who are under your leadership. So, for example, in the home, the father and husband must think about the needs of his wife and children first and to care for that first. Then to take care of his needs and wants. Same thing in the church. The pastor and the elders must be thinking first about the needs of the whole of the church as God leads them to lead the church. It's not about what I want as the pastor. It's about what God wants and what are the needs of the church as a whole. For example, too, a pastor cannot tell you what kind of car to buy. If you decide to buy, purchase a new vehicle, that's your decision. 
Now, if you want to go to the pastor and elders of the church and say, I want your advice on this, whatever it might be, but there's certain areas of life that we have no authority on. The elders have authority in the church when it comes to matters of spiritual things and the way God has called us to live. I think that's important to know today because there's a lot of false teachers out there that say that, oh, you must obey what I tell you to do. So if I tell you to put more offering in the offering plate, do so. <laughs> I remember I was in one church one time. I was a fan of a trumpet player and singer named Phil Driscoll. That's probably been named not many people here these days. But he was playing in one church in Edmonton one time, and, and a few of my, of my friends were fans of his as well too. And so our whole group of us from college and career went to the concert. And that church had three altar calls that night. Two before Phil Driscoll got up on stage to play and sing, and then one at the end. And I remember it had been already been about four hours that we had been in the service, and we were tired. And I had to work the next day working construction. So me and my friends were all in the back row, and we quietly exited. And the minister up front yelled at us and said, you guys sit back down. There are people trying to be saved now. That's not the kind of authority that God's speaking of. That is not, that is a abuse, that's spiritual abuse. When I speak up from before you too, you will hear me say from time to time, test to say, see what I'm saying is true. I don't have ultimate authority. God does. As a pastor, it's limited authority. So make sure you understand and know the limits authority is in, within the church. But I think all of this is a comfort still to know too, that God has given us as Christians authority, especially authority over the spiritual realm. That when we command demons to flee, they must. When we tell them to take a hike because they're attempting us, they are to leave. Now, they may not necessarily leave right away, but we can insist upon it and say, no, you have no right. I'm God's child. I remember one time, uh, Ariel came up when she was really little and came up and she was afraid because of a nightmare. And I told her, here's what you can pray. Or here's what you can say to the, the if it's the demon, you can say, I'm God's child, shoo, go away. Leave me alone. And what happened? They would go away, Right? You'd stop being afraid. I think we did that with all three of our kids, I think. God has given us as Christians authority over the spiritual realm. So it's good to know that we have that kind of authority. That's God's authority. It's not our authority alone. It's the authority that God has given us. In that too, he has given us the authority to go and share the gospel to all those who are lost. No one should ever tell us, or at least we shouldn't listen to those that say, you cannot share the gospel. This is a strange story, but I remember one time I was sharing the gospel here for Heritage Days many summers ago. And one gentleman came up to me who was a Christian and said, you shouldn't be doing that. You can't be sharing the gospel like that. You have to earn the right to share the gospel. <laughs> I heard that What? <laughs> I turned my Bible to him and says, show me where it says that. Well, you, you have to earn the right. No. God has told us in his word, and we've already read that in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, where to go and share the gospel. That's the authority that God has given you. That is the demand that God has given us. No man or woman can tell us otherwise. Not even the government. Now, we recognize that in some countries, the government might say, you can't do that or we'll throw you in jail or kill you. Well, if that happens, that happens. It's part of keep being persecuted for our faith. But... We must obey God rather than man. And God has given us that authority to proclaim the good news. So my brothers and sisters, God has given us his authority. May that be of comfort to you too. Don't use that authority to abuse others. That's not the intent of the authority that God has given us. It's to honor God. Again, because that authority is God's authority to give. 
And if we abuse that authority, God may take that authority away from us. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be continuing to look at authority and specifically what kind of authority has God given us and how are we to use that authority to bring honor and glory to God's name. I'm close with this story here. Amy Carter, who's the daughter of the President of the United States, brought an assignment home one Friday night while her father was still president. Stumped by a question on the Industrial Revolution, Amy sought help from her mother. Rosalind was also fogged by the question and in turn asked an aide to seek clarification from the Labor Department. A rush was placed on the request since the assignment was due Monday. Thinking the question was a serious request from the president himself, a labor, a labor department official immediately cranked up the government computer and kept a full team of technicians and programmers working overtime all weekend at a reported cost of several hundred thousand dollars. The massive computer printed out was finally delivered by truck to the White House that Sunday afternoon. And Amy showed up in class with the official answer the following day. That kind of speaks of the kind of authority the president has, isn't it? It is a little bored, overboard of a situation, but it shows the power and authority that the president has. Similarly, God has authority, ultimate authority over all things. So again, God shows his authority to us. And the Father has given his authority to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And God also gives his authority to those to whom he pleases and for his own good purpose. If you are a Christian, you need not to fear any authority because God is the ultimate authority. So let us then, my brothers and sisters, to rest in the authority of God. There is where perfect peace and hope resides. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you are the one who has ultimate authority. And Lord, we're thankful for whom you give authority to. Because we know that you're still in control. And Lord, we can praise you because we know that when you're in control of things, it's for what is best for us and for your kingdom. It is what is best to bring honor and glory to you. So Father God, we thank you for the authority that you have. And we thank you and praise you for the authority that you give us too. Most of all, Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you have exercised your authority to give us salvation. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great love.